Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to all. My name is Stephen Wagner, and I am a program associate at the National Committee on US-China Relations. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the final program in our China Town Hall series with today's focus on global health and climate change. Thank you all for taking the time to join us for this important conversation as our wonderful panelists explore these critical areas of the relationship. Now, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce our moderator, Merit Jano. Merit is Dean of the Faculty and Professor of the Practice at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. She also serves on our Board of Directors here at the National Committee. Uh, Merit, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Welcome, everyone. Delighted to be with you. It's my privilege to moderate this evening's discussion. And let me briefly introduce uh, our really extraordinary panelists. I will be brief, um, uh, so we have more time for discussion. Uh, but really, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Dar uh, Dr. Margaret Hamburg, an internationally recognized leader in public health and medicine. She's a former commissioner of the US uh, FDA, where she served uh, almost six years in the Obama administration. She was also an assistant secretary for planning and evaluation in the US Department of Health and Human Services, and also had experience in New York City where she was health uh, uh, commissioner. Um, and she's also worked at NIH and also uh, been very, very active with the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. So Dr. Hamburg, Peggy, delighted to have you with us. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, also with us is Ryan Haas, a fellow and the Michael Armacos Chair in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, where he also um, holds a joint appointment to the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asian Policy Studies. He, he was in the inaugural class of the David Ru uh, Rubenstein Fellows at Brookings and is also a non-affiliated fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale Law School. Uh, importantly, he served as director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia in the National Security Council from 2013 to 2017 and advised President Obama and senior White House officials on all aspects of U.S. policy uh, in the region. Ryan, wonderful to have you here as well. And, uh, and I'm also very pleased to welcome Angel Xu, who's Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies at Yale uh, National University of Singapore College, and the founder and director of the Data Driven Enviro Policy Lab, which is a very interdisciplinary policy research group that applies quantitative approaches to pressing environmental issues. And uh, you bring together both science and public policy and the use of data driven approaches to look at questions of environmental sustainability, particularly with respect to climate and energy, air quality and urbanization. So wonderful to have you uh, with us, Professor Xu, as well. So if you don't mind, we'll jump right in um, uh, with a health uh, question, which I'd like to direct to, to Peggy. I think, you know, we're all so focused on COVID-19, of course, um, at this time. But it would be wonderful if you could help orient us to understand from your perspective how we should think about the state of US-China collaboration uh, in medicine and health uh, before COVID-19 as well as after. Some have said this has been historically or in recent years, something of a bright spot in collaboration between the United States and China, and but clearly taken a very tough turn in, in, recent, uh, in the last year. Help us think about what is the state of collaboration and cooperation information exchange around health and science. Well, I so appreciate being part of this panel, this important set of topics and the opportunity to talk with you. Um, health science and medical collaboration between the US and China has been longstanding and very important. Um, and it's manifested in many different ways. There's been the sort of scientist to scientist, physician to physician collaboration that's been very important, whether it is um, trainees coming to this country uh, to uh, pursue aspects of their, their education and work, um, 
early in their careers and then long standing connections between those individuals, even when they go back uh, to China or collaborations in, in specific areas of, of research um, and public health and medical practice. I would say that, you know, in many ways, the US has been very important in helping to shape aspects of the current public health, medical and scientific environment in China. I might be overstating, but you know, some of the areas I know best, there's the, the scientific training I was just talking about and, and you know, many outstanding scientists in China today did, did spend some time training here in this country. Um, in addition though, the, some of the key public health and science-based agencies in China are important partners to us and, and actually have shaped their activities along the lines of our activities with the Chinese CDC, which was begun actually after the SARS um, outbreak back 2003, and the Chinese FDA, which now has another uh, name, but you know, very much um, developed over time with interactions with our FDA and other regulatory authorities, but to try to, to, to learn from us and build from the best possible models. And in the meantime, with this work together and actually people uh, from the US going over there and being embedded in, in their agencies, et cetera, has built lasting relationships and important understandings about how the work is done, what kind of work is done and opportunities for collaboration. COVID has certainly brought into focus some of the, the important issues where collaboration is necessary. There have been you know, some challenges and deficiencies. I think that's true. There have also been enormous successes. And I just have to mention one, which is in this last week, we've gotten enormously promising news about the development of COVID vaccines that may actually be authorized soon for broader use. There's never been vaccine development this rapid. We didn't even know about this novel coronavirus as 2020 began. Um, and we have a vaccine that may become more broadly available within a year. That could not have happened if the Chinese scientists who were struggling to understand this emerging um, and unusual respiratory disease outbreak um, within their country hadn't posted the fruits of their science, the genome of this new coronavirus on the web for scientists in this country and around the world to benefit from. And that was fundamental to the advances um, in biomedical research and new medical product development that have occurred. And that's one reflection of this area of advancing biomedical product development is another important area of collaboration. And there's much more that we can talk about as the session goes forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think that's a lot to, for us to think about and get us started. Let me turn to another area uh, where it would seem that the US and China would have a lot uh, that we need to collaborate on, and, and that's around climate uh, and the environment, if I could turn to Professor Xu. You know, at the time of the, of the Paris uh, Accord, I think uh, I remember well the, the fact that the U.S. and China had agreed uh, on some important steps in advance of, of Paris uh, was seen as instrumental to, uh, to the Paris Accord going forward. And of course, the US and China are the two largest, um, you know, emitters. Um, and intriguing, both President Xi at the UN, you know, spoke about being carbon neutral, set a goal of 2060. And recently, uh, President elect has, has also identified a goal of uh, net zero by 2050. So I guess um, I'm in inviting you to, to share with us how, how, how do you assess what, what China has done in recent years? And then, um, you know, is it continuing to advance the, uh, an aggressive agenda or, uh, or, you know, with Paris sort of under strain by the U.S. pulling out and so forth, uh, has it slowed everyone down? Or how do you assess what China has been doing? 
Well, thank you so much, Merritt, for that question. And thanks so much to the committee for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. And exactly as you said, Merritt, I don't think I can underscore how important the US-China relationship on climate change was to securing the Paris Agreement. So someone who has long been following and an observer at these international climate negotiations dating back to 2009 when there was the Copenhagen climate negotiations and that was a really watershed moment. And then we saw US and, and China's relation really strained by conversations and how that whole agreement unfolded. And so then to basically turn into a 180 and have the two largest emitters responsible for almost 40% of global emissions come together in 2014, Presidents Obama and Xi say, we're gonna break this mutual impasse between our two countries and actually work together because we have to work together in order to solve global climate change. And so that was really instrumental to building the confidence amongst other governments, particularly developing countries, India, Brazil, to also come in and, and engage in the Paris Agreement. And so it would have never passed if it weren't for the US and China laying important groundwork to come together to do something on climate change. And so that being said, it's been incredibly disappointing to see then the US government essentially retreat from the, from the Paris Agreement. So one of the first things that President Trump did when he came into office was to say, we're gonna remove ourselves, remove the US from the Paris Agreement. And of course that took a while to happen. That actually happened last week. And President-elect Biden fortunately has said the first thing that he wants to do is to re-engage into that climate change agreement because we have lost a lot of time. And simply, if we look at the science, we only have this last decade. We only have the next 10 years to really reverse course. We're currently headed way off track and headed towards a three and a half, four degree Celsius warming world when we need to contain that to two degrees or 1.5 degrees. And so we essentially need to, to, to implement ambitious action. So we've lost a lot of time, I think, on ambition. And that's one of the reasons why what you mentioned during the UN General Assembly at the end of September was tremendous for China to come out ahead and to say that they want to commit to carbon neutrality by 2060 or sooner, that was really tremendous because traditionally we haven't seen China come forth and, and be a leader on climate change and environmental issues in this way. It's traditionally been in the context of bilateral agreements with the United States, for example. And so for China to just come out unilaterally and say, we're not going to wait for the U.S. and to see what happens with the outcome of the U.S. election, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to commit because this is something that's important for us to address concerns of air quality, energy security, climate change impacts, vulnerability, for example. And, and, and we need to, we know that coal is cannot be a part of our energy mix for much longer and to actually phase out coal by 2050, because that's essentially what they have to do in order to, to meet that carbon neutrality target. And currently around 68% of the energy mix is still derived from coal. And so that's gonna require an enormous amount of effort. So the challenge is really, I think, ahead for China, uh, but the good news is that they have continued to make progress despite what the US has, has not been doing on climate change, they have continued to make progress on climate change. They're on track to meeting their Paris climate target, which admittedly is not that ambitious. And so independent analysis by the Climate Action Tracker Project has shown that China's efforts alone are not gonna be enough to lead us to that two degrees or that 1.5 degree path, but at least they have not reneged on their climate change efforts and they've continued to push on clean energy, on research and development in clean energy, increase targets uh, domestically for consuming more solar and wind energy, for example. So at least that's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Good, well, we'll come back. I think this is very, very important. Um, you know, Ryan, you have seen from the White House um, the whole picture of um, US-China relations, uh, economic and security, and you've certainly had uh, visibility into these core areas of tonight's focus on health and the environment. Uh, and, and ones that in theory are transnational issues that countries can't solve by themselves and where uh, uh, you know, collaboration where it can be found uh, is really, really powerful. So. So what, what's your assessment of the progress that, that you know, has been achieved um, and, and do you perceive it as being you know, fundamentally derailed or, or there uh, you know, to be seized going forward? Well, first of all, Merritt, thank you for, uh, for leading us through this discussion. It's really an honor for me to be with you and, and Peggy and Angel and I appreciate the National Committee bringing us all together. Uh, I should start by stating the obvious, which is that I'm neither a climate nor a health expert, so I will 
uh, be modest in my uh, opinions on those issues and largely defer to, to Peggy and Angel to talk about them. But, but like you mentioned, I do have uh, uh, a perspective. I've been around the relationship for a while. And uh, I think that I can try to help situate where these issues fit within the relationship. And the, the first thought I'd like to offer in response to your question is that I find it rather extraordinary uh, that in recent years, the United States and China have struggled so mightily uh, to deal together with climate change and COVID-19. Uh, I feel like COVID-19 in a way has held a mirror up to the relationship and the picture that has come back uh, isn't pretty. Uh, it has shown that even in instances where the lives of Americans and Chinese are at stake, uh, both of our countries are allowing, uh, you know, tensions and, and sort of political dynamics to impede uh, what should be uh, a pretty active space for, for cooperation. And so the question that I have uh, right now is whether this moment is a precursor of a long-term trend or a short-term aberration. And I'm going to try to make an optimistic case tonight uh, that, uh, that we will find ways to restore uh, functionality and, and cooperation and coordination on some of these issues in the relationship. But I have to be honest, that I'm, I'm making this case more out of optimism than certainty. Uh, but I make the case based upon you know, sort of the following assumptions. The first assumption is that both countries have spent a lot of effort in recent years to achieve the level of dysfunction and toxicity uh, that exists in the relationship. Um, I don't expect that uh, it will be in either side's interest to sustain uh, the current downward dive angle uh, of the relationship into the future. And second, and relatedly, I'm of the view that over the long term, countries' actions are guided by their identification of their, of their national interests. And I think that we can make a pretty persuasive case, and, and Angel and Peggy already have begun to tonight, that it is in both of our countries' national interest to find ways to work together and to spur collective action to address some of these threats that neither country can address on its own, but that both will be uh, impacted negatively by if, if left unaddressed. And so I, I still think that it's possible uh, to restore and regain some of the muscle memory that had been building uh, prior to 2017. And we saw, you know, if you, if you think back, there was a pattern that was becoming pretty well grouped, whether it was over Sudan or the global financial crisis or the Ebola outbreak um, or the Paris Climate Accord or building capacity around peacekeeping. Our two countries, two major powers were able to come together when the circumstances demanded it uh, and take action. Uh, I don't wanna glorify those experiences because uh, they often underperformed and they often required much more effort than should have been necessary. But nevertheless, I think that we can make a persuasive case that a clear pattern was emerging. And I'm confident uh, that that pattern uh, can be reestablished going forward. Good, well, thank you. We'll, we'll come back and, and uh, push you on that a little bit about how do, we, how do we operationalize that. Let me go back to Peggy and you, know, you, you, you made the you know, really encouraging comment about vaccine development and the rapidity and the, and the contribution of, of, of China in making the genome available that helped accelerate science around the world. China has also, I think, indicated its intention to roll out vaccine in the developing world uh, as, a, as a matter of both science and foreign policy uh, priorities. Can you share, do you know what is that homegrown vaccine uh, development, or is there an area where the U.S. and China are cooperating today around vaccine development? I have the impression that there's very little cooperation directly occurring, but that may not be true. I'm afraid you're on mute. You would think I would have learned how to unmute on Zoom by now, <laughs> but, um, you know, the vaccines that are, are um, uh, now in use in, in China and some other parts of the world um, have been developed within China by Chinese-based um, companies. And, um, you know, I, I, in all honesty, you know, I think that it would be great if there could be a little bit more transparency into how those vaccines have been developed um, and the testing uh, that has been done and the, the existing data 
uh, it did seem that they uh, accelerated some aspects of the vaccine uh, uh, clinical trial process more than we would have anticipated. There's been a great challenge for all of us in terms of how do you accelerate the vaccine R&D process without cutting corners that might harm our ability to truly assess efficacy and importantly safety because with vaccines you know you have to remember you're giving it to people who are otherwise healthy to protect them from getting a disease um, so you know you you care about efficacy um, but you really care about safety because you don't want to make healthy people sick um, so i wish there was more transparency and and i think there's opportunities for more collaboration um, it, going forward in terms of what have we learned about medical product development, including vaccines and also about public health. There's a lot that's been happening, you know, going back to the sort of scientist to scientist relationships and the scientific organization to scientific organization as well. I've been involved in very productive discussions around vaccine issues and many other issues through the Chinese Academy of Science and the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And you know, I applaud those activities and they have enabled us to engage at very high levels and with great expertise. Um, but there still are constraints in some aspects of the relationship that I think as we go forward, you know, we need to, to work on in order to to really take greater advantage of science as a global enterprise and there are great minds in China and great minds here. But also I, I do think that it is really important in these key areas of medical products that as much as possible that we do adhere to the same you know, general set of standards and approaches because if, if a vaccine from China turns out to be um, less safe than hoped for or anticipated, it can undermine the whole vaccine enterprise much more broadly. And the same is true, you know, if something happens here, it, it, it has reverberations there. So we all really in this scientific community and public health community, I think understand that, that we have an opportunity to find better solutions working together because of collaboration and the pooling of, of intellectual resources and other resources, but also that we have an obligation to be as responsible as possible in, in what we actually um, produce from these scientific efforts and how they are appropriately used. Mm -hmm. Could you say, before we leave uh, this subject, could you just say another word, excuse me, on where you think, where the vehicles are for, for becoming as, as uh, transparent as possible? Is it doctor to doctor? Is it association by association? If you're trying to imagine building confidence in increasing transparency, how is that gonna happen? Is it operationalized? Is it, is it, through, is it through the medical associations uh, 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 professionals, or do you need other entities to be created to do this? Is the World Health Organization uh, the vehicle that uh, we should be uh, hoping becomes more active? How do we think about this actually maturing? Yeah, well, I think it should be a multifaceted <coughs> approach, you know, because I think that that we really want to be able to have governmental agency to governmental agency collaboration and transparency, but we also want to have a very open and thriving scientific um, uh, collaboration that can happen through uh, research institutions and medical care institutions, can happen through individuals um, working together, and it can happen through scientific organizations and professional societies working together. I think all of that is important. One thing that I do know is that it was very, very valuable at an earlier time when there were US professionals uh, from the CDC and the FDA who are actually working in China, uh, interacting every day 
with, with their officials and their professionals. And, you know, it gave us, you know, much greater insight into activities that were underway. It also gave us an opportunity um, to really collaborate. And it, and it gave us, I think, a much stronger platform to build the kind of trust and confidence that we need going forward. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, let me turn to Angel and ask you a similar kind of question. I mean, uh, you know, I think it, it, we're, what you spoke to was the need to um, develop sort of shared understandings and approaches and mechanisms for, for decarbonization pathways. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly a collective action problem. So. Uh, and you said we've lost time. So how do you think we create incentives for more action earlier? Is it just a question of, I mean, do we, you know, do actions in, in the US, we're talking about re, uh, a host of actions being talked about by the president elect. Do you imagine those having a catalytic effect uh, on China? I mean, how do you imagine the dynamic uh, working uh, to, create incentives for action earlier? Is there anything that can be done to do that? Well, I wanna go back to what Peggy was saying because actually when she was speaking, I was furiously taking notes because I think so many of the things that she pointed to, a multifaceted approach, science to science exchange, industry associations, public private dialogues, all of this that applies to health, these same types of exchanges also apply to climate and energy and, and, and environmental cooperation. And so I remember uh, in, in several of my years spent living in Beijing, one of the best um, exchanges that I ever participated in were the regional air quality management uh, seminars and exchanges by the US Environmental Protection Agency and also the State Environmental Protection Agency, now MEP and now MEEP for ecology and environmental protection. So that, uh, I mean, I think all of that still applies. And thankfully in the last four years, even though at the highest national levels, there hasn't been that same type of engagement between the two countries, on the lower levels, there still has been exchange. And so I think about, for example, in my work, looking specifically at the role of state governments and, and subnational actors uh, that also have been uh, instrumental in helping to implement the Paris Agreement and continuing action on climate change. And so the good news is that that kind of exchange has still happened in the last four years. In 2018, former California Governor Jerry Brown hosted this Global Climate Action Summit specifically to call attention to the role that city governments, local actors, and businesses can play in helping to drive climate action. And so he invited a huge delegation from China and they had a China pavilion on the sidelines of this larger summit to continue that exchange. And more than a dozen MOUs, memorandums of understanding were signed between then governor Jerry Brown and the Chinese uh, counterparts. And so they were signing agreements on emissions trading. So to, to facilitate exchange, California has had their own uh, state level emissions trading scheme for several years now. And of course, China has been experimenting with regional schemes and they launched a national scheme last year and so that kind of exchange has been important also on clean energy vehicles, zero emissions vehicles. All of this ex exchange uh, happened in 2018 and continues to happen. And so I think that's a way that uh, we can feel hopeful <laughs> that uh, when we have a, a shift in administration that all of the pieces have not just completely been lost and, and everything hasn't been stagnant. I think we can look towards these subnational exchanges and these person to person, scientist to scientist, organization to organization exchanges to help uh, immediately re-engage. And then I think at the internet national level, just having President-elect Biden say that he, he wants to commit the U.S. to become also carbon neutral by 2050. And then also he is talking about developing a, a cabinet level climate change position within his administration. I mean, that would all go a really long way because I think even though there still has been this bottom up and these uh, multi-level exchanges that have still occurred, we still need to have the high level coordination in order to provide those incentives that you mentioned. And so uh, if in order to, for us to move rapidly, I think that's still a really critical part. And so I'm personally looking forward to seeing how we can tie all these things together in the next several years and try to regain some of that ground that we've lost. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's very, that's very helpful. May I ask you a kind of um, framing uh, question, though? I mean, one might think that in this period of COVID-19, when there's been such a drop in economic activity, 
uh, that there would have been a, a, a significant uh, decline in, in emissions. But I'm hearing that's not the case, uh, uh, you know, in China. Can, can you, do you have the data around that? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so, so you're absolutely right. Because of the economic shutdown measures, there were um, actually the greatest dip in uh, emissions that we've seen uh, since uh, in, in modern times. So um, certainly prior, I mean, even when you compare economic depression events, still emissions achieved the lowest uh, drops that they have, that the world has ever seen. In April, on some days, emissions dropped as much as 25% globally on a given day because of economic shutdown measures. And uh, so I think there was a lot of discussion in the circles that, that I run in that, oh, well, I mean, this, this could be really tremendous. This could give us that moment of reset. If we look at the end of the year, the projections and the models are looking like the uh, total impact on emissions will be around 4%. So right now it's, it's, it was kind of hovering between seven and 12% at the height of the shutdown period, but now it looks like because economies have opened up, China's including, and, and we see already in the data looking at China's emissions that they also achieved record emissions reductions, but then when the economy started to open back up, they bounced right back. And so the models are assimil uh, similarly assuming that that same thing is gonna happen for other governments as well. So we may expect at the end of the year around 4% as the median scenario for over for all emissions reductions, which would still be huge if you consider the past couple of years since 2017, we've seen an uptick in global emissions. And that's largely been driven by China and China's own economic stimulus and also from uh, the industrial sectors, a kick, kick up in emissions. And then also with additional coal-fired power plants coming online and more coal-fired power plants also in the line. Um, so that, that has been disappointing in the last couple of years to see emissions go up. Um, but what it amounts to, if we look at what we need to do, which is to have global emissions by 2030, we're going to need to have a COVID size impact on emissions reductions every year for the next 10 years if we're going to meet our goals. So that just gives you some type of way to frame the, the enormity of the challenge ahead, ahead of us. And we know that if we look at 2008 and the impact on global emissions then, it was nowhere near to the same magnitude as we've already experienced. And emissions also went back up. They rebounded as well after uh, the global financial crisis in 2008. So the hope is, is that we can take this moment and we can take a pause and say, okay, well, we have these goals of economic recovery, of uh, securing uh, climate justice, and also addressing climate change, reducing emissions. How can we do those things all together? And so I'm also really encouraged by the framing of a Green New Deal. And so um, Senator Markey and, and, and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez introduced this idea of we don't have to sacrifice economic growth for climate or environmental goals and vice versa. We can actually achieve them together. And I think the same framing has resonance also in China, where you talk about uh, the need to shift millions of workers out of heavy polluting industries such as iron and steel and also um, uh, coal, for example. And so what would what, what just transition look like also in the Chinese context? And I think that's also an opportunity where the US and, and China can really learn from each other and work together on similar challenges. So Ryan, we've been asked, talking now very much in you know actions taken in China or in the United States or in collaboration, but one of the uh, interesting themes of the president elect uh, is uh, that he's going to do differently is work with our allies. And, you know, I think some of the subtext of that is work with our allies on a host of issues, including with respect to China um, and concerns that we might share. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you think about, about the scope for working with our allies vis-a-vis um, -vis China on the matters we're discussing, health and climate, is that an air? Is that a vehicle you think for advancing uh, shared progress? Well, it, it's a great question, and I very much agree with uh, your sentiment, Merritt, that the the president-elect seems very focused on trying to aggregate the voices of our allies for dealing with the challenges that uh, that China poses, uh, and I think that there's a lot of scope for for that to be done. Um, but I would hate for that focus to come at the expense of working with China on some of these issues, because I think it has to be a both and uh, approach rather than an either or approach. And I, I, I think that there are a few practical ways that uh, we could sort of get things back on track uh, in terms of um, uh, moving forward uh, coordination with China on both health and climate issues. 
uh, and I'll just offer a, a few very briefly. The, the first uh, is to focus, to have our leaders focus on facts, focus on problems that need to be solved, be clear eyed and you know, maybe lead, leave the mudslinging to, to others. Uh, secondly, I think that uh, it would be healthy for both sides to acknowledge uh, that it is possible to cooperate with competitors. I think the relationship between the United States and China is fundamentally competitive, will remain fundamentally competitive, but that really doesn't need to be an impediment uh, to our two countries' ability to cooperate when it serves both of our, our interests to do so. Um, Next or third, I, I think that we in the United States are going to need to approach these discussions uh, with the Chinese as a peer to peer discussion. It's not a teacher to student discussion. It's not a leader to subordinate discussion. Uh, both countries have uh, material capacity that they can bring to bear uh, to deal with these issues and, and we're going to need to approach in, in that matter. And then the final thought that I would just leave with is something that sort of piggybacks on what, what Peggy and Angel were, were just talking about, which is that to the extent that our experts, our scientists, our researchers can help us identify scope and pace for progress on some of these issues, uh, I think that will be much healthier than uh, having uh, you know, politicians um, really making decisions around cooperation on these issues and using them as sort of a light switch mood marker of whether or not we're happy or, or disgruntled uh, with China. And so the more that we can get our scientists and our experts sitting down next to each other, working together, uh, the higher the confidence I'm going to have about uh, our two countries' capacity to cooperate. Well, let, let me ask you, uh, uh, push you a little bit, because you know you, you made an earlier comment about how uh, how cooperation and competition were both attributes uh, uh, of the relationship and that we had been moving down a path where there's increasing tension and even uh, some uh, decoupling. So, uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of discussion about the effects of this uh, COVID-19 crisis also on supply chain and how, you know, we had to be building more at home, uh, whether it's uh, uh, around uh, clean tech uh, or it's PPE in the medical area, we had to be more mindful of, of what has to be done at home. So there, there are lots of contrary trends going on now. So um, if you think about the last few years and the period that we're still in, are there areas that you think we, we have to be more uh, inward looking uh, and protective, uh, even as we try and explore new new areas for cooperation? Absolutely. Uh, and I don't think it's unreasonable for the United States to want to feel secure in its, uh, in its access to things like PPE. Um, and if I could just borrow an idea from your colleague, Tom Christensen, uh, you know, Tom talks a lot about how in the United States assures itself of its energy security by having an oil reserve. A strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, I think that a similar concept could be applied uh, in some of the areas that you described, uh, whether it's PPP, PPE or vaccines, etc. Uh, that would give us confidence uh, and comfort uh, to be able to engage on some of this, these issues without feeling uh, vulnerability that uh, leads to defensiveness and sort of a zero sum, I win, you lose uh, attitude towards uh, what really are effectively shared problems that threaten all of humanity. Mm -hmm. Peggy, I wonder if you wanted to comment in this area. I mean, uh, whether, uh, again, this, this period, um, you know, I mean, it's filled with ironies, of course. Some of the areas where we imposed tariffs later became um, a, a real problem because it included PPE equipment uh, that we needed in, in the crisis. But um, are there things that we should be sure to be producing at home? Uh, do you think about those questions? Well, I do. And certainly when I was commissioner of the FDA, I was really startled when I learned just how much of what the FDA was responsible for regulating was being made in whole or in part in other countries. And a lot of it was in China. And this was true on the, 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 the drug and device side, as well as on the food side. Um, and, you know, it is the case that most of the active pharmaceutical ingredients um, in drugs used in the United States actually come uh, from China and other important um, 
medical products are, are, are made in China or partially. Um, so we need to look at that. And you know, one of the things that we worked hard with, with our Chinese colleagues on was trying to find ways both to enhance their regulatory oversight of these products to ensure um, standards of quality and performance, but also how to work together to better assure the supply chain. We always recognize that there would be vulnerabilities with certain kind of dislocations that could be a political crisis or some kind of um, uh, natural crisis, a weather or um, you know uh, geological crisis or um, you know a pandemic uh, crisis. Um, so I think as we're coming out of COVID, we have to be careful not to be too reactive and say, bring it all to the US. But I think we do have to think strategically about you know, what can be done here um, and what should be done here, but also how to still work on this collaboration and greater transparency around um, existing strategies and find ways um, to upgrade some of what currently is in place. And again, this isn't a uniquely US concern. Other countries have these same concerns and you know, there needs to be more global governance around all of this, I think. Um, but I, I think it'd be a huge mistake to think that we could and should do it all in the US. Uh, people would be very surprised what that would mean. It would mean skyrocketing of prices for one thing, um, but it would also mean vulnerabilities of a different kind, you know, because there could be problems, you know, here. And if we have everything based in one set of facilities here in the US, it might make us safer um, in certain kinds of crises, but it also could make us very vulnerable. So I think we need a distributed approach. We need a thoughtful approach. We need a, an approach that recognizes that countries do have very distinct needs, but that we also, for better or for worse, exist in a globalized world, and that in fact, most of the challenges before us, big picture, certainly are shared problems where the only way to find solutions is to work together. And, and I think that the fact that we have to learn to work together to solve those problems means we ought to also work on working together to address other more routine concerns. And I think we can do it. Um, and we, we should do it. But I was very struck by what Ryan said, you know, I too was taking notes because, you know, one of the things we do is have to focus on facts and we have to look at the realities of the world that we live in instead of, um, you know, the sort of caricatures that get created and the sort of boogeymen and, and, um, and acting on, on fears or past hostilities. You know, there is no way we can make progress on health or climate change or the important intersection of climate change and health unless we focus on the facts and we cooperate and we recognize that while we may be competitive nations on many fronts that that you know science doesn't have to be a zero sum game if we work together to solve these problems we will all benefit and if we don't work together we all will suffer so i think we have to keep pounding on those those points that Ryan made and the notion that, that we need to think about it peer to peer, I think is also very, very important. And I do think that, you know, China, I'm not a China scholar, but I've worked, you know, on various issues with Chinese colleagues and, you know, they have a huge amount to offer. Um, they have sought to learn from, from us in many ways, but we have also learned from them hugely and we have to continue to find those ways to develop the mutual collaboration and mutual respect that's needed in our modern world. Thank you very much. That's a very, very powerful argument. And I think as we are really entering a national debate um, that will continue the next few years about what does resilience in the supply chain mean? This is really very important insights. I'm going to open it up to turn to some of the questions that we've gotten, but before we leave the environment, I sort of feel, Angel, we, we haven't used, we haven't talked about coal. And you know that's been a, a real concern, I think, about China still building coal plants, both at home and, and through the BRI initiative. Any, any, any word on what you think um, the prospects are for uh, addressing that challenge? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that this is one of the, the greatest um, pain points, I think, uh, for someone who studies China's environment and climate change. And I'm also an optimist like Ryan. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and, and, and China has made incredible strides over the last several decades in reducing the energy intensity of its growth and cleaning up air pollution in many of the major cities and, and really increasing the amount of solar and wind that it not only consumes, but also in terms of the technology that it exports and has also brought down the price of, and going back to Peggy's point, about the, the cost of some of these um, PPE and medical supplies that that might be threat that that would go up if it weren't for China's cooperation. And then I think um, a point also that many like to point to is the fact that China has been investing and supporting and exporting a lot of the excess coal capacity domestically to other parts of the world, particularly Southeast Asia, actually where I am now, and we're feeling the effects of it on a seasonal basis when we get horrible air pollution and transboundary haze from other parts of Southeast Asia, particularly Indonesia. Um, but what has been encouraging, so on Monday at a European business forum, I was following the, the streaming and um, it sounds like Shi Zhenhua, who was the former head of the Chinese climate change delegation, he did say that this was unsustainable and that China certainly cannot make good on its climate goals or be seen as a global leader, or even I think in good faith, commit to this carbon neutrality target if they continue to support coal overseas. And so that to me was incredibly encouraging. It was the first time that I heard a high level Chinese leader say something explicitly about the need to actually stop supporting and exporting this coal technology. And so this is why I mentioned before that I think the notion of a just transition is really critical in the Chinese context, not just in the US context, but also in China, where you're going to have to find some, some alternatives for both workers who are employed in these industries and also businesses that uh, their livelihoods depend on um, exporting a lot of this technology or at least uh, having some use for this technology if it's not domestically or abroad. And so this is a, a challenge that China is grappling with right now. But I personally was very encouraged to hear that the Chinese leadership is really starting to think about it. I think there's been a lot of pressure on the international community. Uh, but then I think also being here in Southeast Asia, I see that there still is a lot of demand for cheap power. And unfortunately, coal is, is affordable, it's cheap. And uh, even though we've seen the price of solar uh, go down quite a lot due to China, I think there's still a lot of resistance and a lot of path dependent processes that, that still lock in um, some of these fossil fuel technologies for at least the, the near to midterm. And so I think um, also there needs to be more engagement in, in broader Southeast Asia where we see the most growth in coal and the expected growth in coal for the next uh, several years. And so I, I think it also, need, I think China has fairly received a lot of the criticism, but I think also there needs to be more efforts, I think regionally uh, to, 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 uh, to also have countries here in Southeast Asia commit to uh, carbon neutrality or similar decarbonization goals and recognize that coal simply can't be part of that pathway. Thank you. Uh, we, we've gotten a couple more questions uh, this evening uh, that, that are really aimed at, the, at, at climate issues. And, and really, um, um, Angela, I don't want to make you have to answer all of them. Uh, Ryan may have some views on, on some of this as well. You know, the one line of questioning is really what kind of uh, leverage does the international community have in, in kind of encouraging shifts of of perspective or incentives in China, uh, you know, at the local level, because often, you know, uh, you know, party officials at the local level have to meet, you know, local uh, targets and local incentives, and so you 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 need to get pretty um, specific, uh, and that's sort of something I think Angel's been thinking about, but probably Ryan has as well. Um, another uh, kind of set of questions is really uh, about. Um, you know, uh, about how much kind of greenwashing is going on um, in China, making things look green, but, uh, or, or, or look like they're taking climate commitment seriously, uh, but without really uh, uh, doing so. I mean, that's a, a criticism, I think, that could be directed in many places, but um, I wonder, Ryan, if you'd like to speak to either of those. Well, uh, thank you, Mary. I will be extremely brief because I want to cede most of my time to Angel, uh, who I think will have a much better perspective on these questions than me. But um, one of the things that I served in uh, US Embassy Beijing for four years and had a chance to travel around the country uh, during that period. 
And one of the things that I was really struck by was sort of how chaotic and messy China really is. You know, so it's easy standing outside of China to develop this perception of Xi Jinping making every decision and governing every action inside China. When you go to different provinces and municipalities, you realize how messy the process is. There are hundreds of different laboratories inside China trying to figure out how to meet the targets uh, that the central government has set. And the reason I make that point is because I think it provides space for the uh, subnational cooperation to really have meaning, to inject ideas uh, at a subnational level that are given a chance to be tested and potentially scale uh, inside China. And so I think that there is a breadcrumb trail process that is possible. But I also think that at the same time, it's very important for the United States, as we were talking about earlier, to have uh, a lot of commonality of purpose and sort of a chorus effect in really pushing the Chinese uh, to up the scale of their ambition and to meet uh, the ambitious targets that they're set. So mm -hmm. those were, would be sort of the two angles of approach that uh, would come to mind for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Angel, would you like to just, is there anything specific that can be done to shift incentives at the local level? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Ryan 100%. And I would say that whoever asked this question really hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think this is the reason why people say that China is often the land of contradictions, exactly as Ryan said, where you could have the central leadership saying climate change is really important and we're going to adopt these binding targets for climate change and energy within our five-year plans. But then at the local level, you have local governments that clearly have a misalignment of incentives and they have local economies and GDP targets in order to, to achieve. And so they continue to prop up coal fired power plants and local industries that are very polluting. I think one of the encouraging signs in this year of COVID on the part of the national leadership was to not specify for the first time, even an aspirational or a soft target for GDP at the national level. And so I think that should help to shift some of the incentives at the local scale to emphasize more high quality growth that is less polluting and that is more sustainable in the long run. But yeah, that's exactly one of the reasons, especially when China, the central government um, allowed for more local approvals of coal fired power plants. I mean, that's one of the reasons why now we see this huge uptick. I think the latest count was something around 250 gigawatts of coal fired power that's either um, being constructed right now or that is planned to be constructed. That's more coal fire capacity than the US has in, in total and also in India. And so I think until we are able to, to better align those incentives, I think that you're gonna to continue to see this mismatch where you have the central government committing and saying one thing and the local government doing something different. Um, for the greenwashing point, I think that's quite interesting because Merritt, I think you're right that you can apply that to companies and actors all over the world. And this is something that uh, in my work in looking at the role of subnational and non-state climate actors, I've gotten a lot. Um, and so in working directly with the Paris government and the UN climate secretariat in the lead up to Paris, they specifically said, we want to have data and, and really understand and be able to quantify and, and, and know what these actors are doing and whether or not they're implementing their actions because we're really concerned Learned that if there's greenwashing happening and not actual implementation of these targets and these goals, it's going to risk credibility to the whole climate change movement. And I will say in China, I, I feel like there is less risk of this greenwashing because of the added accountability of these central government targets that are binding, that have been adopted as part of the five-year plans. And as Ryan said, then are passed on to the provinces and to the local governments to then actually implement. And so looking at the data, at least, we can see that these actions are being implemented, the targets are being met. Uh, but then that goes back to the question that I alluded to in the beginning, which is there has been criticism in hindsight that these targets were never that ambitious to begin with. Um, and so that's why I think having this 2060 long-term target, and, and we see in the environmental management and policy literature and evidence that when you have these long-term targets and these policies that can really help to coordinate and motivate and to align those incentives to get the whole of society moving towards a common goal. Thank you. Peggy, I, I'd like to go back. I mean, there's so much to discuss around health uh, issues. I feel you've, you've, you've started us opening our minds, but we could, we could really spend the whole evening talking about, about health. Um, and, and we're at the point in our program where I think we, we need to invite each of you to offer recommendations from a leadership perspective. What would you uh, recommend uh, to leaders in either country or both that would be concrete practical steps that we might take 
to do just as you say, to improve the relationship and build cooperation frameworks. Could you, could you get us started thinking in an ambitious but practical way? Well, thank you. And it ties into, I really wanted to comment on what Angel had been saying. And, you know, I mean, this may not be realistic, but I think we should put health at the center for both um, broader issues of health and climate change in the environment. Because at the end of the day, health really matters to people. It really matters also to economies and productivity and to safety and security of, of communities and of nations. And, and I really do think my sense in China is that part of what has galvanized um, the Chinese government, maybe I'm naive, but is that civil society started to really care, not because of the potential for ocean rise or the bleaching of coral reefs, but because they could see the impacts of climate change and environmental degradation on their health. You know, air pollution, mercury in the water, you know, all kinds of things that were impacting their safety, health, and well being. The same is true in the US in motivating people to really think about and care about climate change. In this period, when we are so focused on, on health and disease because of COVID, it's a powerful moment, I think, to, to really remind people both about the importance of you know, looking at the facts and acting them, not being complacent, not pretending that problems will go away if we shove them under the rug, but, but act on the facts before us to address, address critical challenges that, that matter on this fundamental level and beyond. And then also the importance of bringing science to bear um, and really harnessing science and technology in the service of people and society and the future of both of our nations and our planet. Thank you so much. I think we, we are very short on time. So let me invite Ryan and Angel to answer the same question, one minute each. I will, uh, thank you. I will be very brief. Uh, my, my hope or my suggestion would be for our leaders to develop sort of a clear-eyed understanding of the nature, the fundamental nature of the relationship. Uh, the United States is not going to change China. China is not going to change the United States. We're two big, powerful countries uh, that are going to have to interact with each other. Uh, I think that we're locked in a relationship of competitive interdependence. It's fundamentally competitive, uh, but as Peggy was saying, there is a inherent interdependence. If we work together to solve some of these problems, we will all benefit. If we ignore challenges or refuse to work with each other, we will all suffer. And so uh, from uh, sort of a, a clear eyed view of the relationship, I think that space may emerge for us to deal with some of these challenges. Thank you very much. Angel, you have the last recommendation. Wow, this is, uh, pressure's on. <laughs> I would, I would again, just um, emphasize my co-panelists' excellent points, both Ryan and Peggy, I think really hit the nails on the head. I think placing health at the center, and I think this is the moment because everyone is focused, and I think they see the consequences when you don't put health and you don't prioritize facts and science at the center of policy and, um, and relationships. And so I think uh, that's definitely the organizing principle that we should take from uh, this conversation. And then hopefully our leaders will be pay attention and also move forward to do exactly the things that Ryan said, putting aside the egos and realizing that antagonism is not going to solve urgent problems like solving a global pandemic or addressing global climate change. And so, yeah, and, and simply we don't have time. We, we can't continue to, to go back and forth. And, and I think there's too much on the line uh, to not work together and to do something and, and, to, and to really, I think, shift course and, and get back on track uh, because the rest of us depend on it. Thank you very much. It's been a privilege having this conversation with all of you, truly expert. And I'd like to hand uh, this back to Steve Wagner and uh, our host, uh, Steve. Thanks so much, Merritt. And thank you, of course, to our panelists, Peggy, Angel, Ryan. That was a very thought-provoking discussion. I, I know we could listen to you all talk for a few more hours, but unfortunately we are out of time. Um, and thanks to all of you in the audience for participating in the final night of the National Committee's 2020 China Town Hall series. 
Um, we, we hope you will continue to join the National Committee's programs in the future as we chart a path forward for the US-China relationship. Uh, you might have seen that I posted a link to subscribe to our mailing list in the chat box for anyone interested. And for a full list of our upcoming events, please visit our website, ncuscr.org slash events. Thank you so much again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, a real privilege. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye.